All right, I am very excited about this topic. Tonight I'm gonna talk on promises. And it's something that has been building from what we've been hearing in this house over many weeks from the Word of God, Big D, um, from blessing that Pastor Sarah talked about, from the wisdom of God, all of this, what we can say is all of that is summed up in the promises of God for us. The promises of God center on a person, the person of Jesus. And he gave up everything that he had to give you everything. And so when we don't take seriously what it costs him and what he offers us, we really rob ourselves. So it's important for us that we know what are the promises of God towards us. And I also wanted to share this because right now we're at a time, if you look outside, if you pay attention at all, it is a time where this world is on very shaky ground. Culture, what's happening in the school system, what happens at work for you guys, the values that you see, it is shaky and it's not going to get better in that sense. But what is going to get better is the people of God becoming solid, yep. solid. And as the world gets shakier, your solidness will stand out even more. Yep. And you'll point to the source of that. That's right. And that's how Jesus' name gets famous. So um, this is really important. I think of when we don't know the promises of God, our stance, our posture, I was asking DK, what was that in the Karate Kid when they like, and he's like, sweep the leg. And that's what happens when you are not on solid ground. The enemy can sweep yep. your leg and take yep. you out when you're not in the right posture, when you're not in the right stance. And so to be honest, tonight I want us to declare war. Preach. Declare war on the gaps in your life. The gaps in your life of what God has promised you and what you're seeing in your life right now. Declare war, okay? This is not a joke. This is not a game. God wants you to declare war on those gaps because he gave up everything to give you that. So you need to take that seriously. And I'm preaching to myself, guys. <laughs> so you will be encouraged if you reach out and grab this word. And if you don't, I'm going to be encouraged. So there's at least one person in the house that's going to be encouraged tonight. Amen. But I'm trusting that God's going to deposit stuff into each of you as you focus on him and what he's trying to do in your life. So it's promises, but it's promises and breakthrough prayers. Because when we apply the promises of God in our life, explosion happens. The promises lead to prayers that are effective in this world, and that's what we're made for. Throughout scripture, there's 8,810 promises found in scripture. Some guy counted, and it took him a year and a half to count and to, to get that number right. And out of those, 7,487 are promises from God to us. So 85% of the promises in scripture are God's promises to us. Amen. That's good news. <laughs> That's great news. 991 of the promises in scripture are from one man to another man. And 290 promises found in scripture are from man to God. And I just think these numbers are just slightly hilarious because it's like look at all the promises God gives us look at the promises we give back to God and the promises we give we prefer making promises to a man over a God who is faithful to us we make vows to man before we make vows to God so this number is kind of comical I feel like in these numbers is the gospel is God's goodness to us despite, you know, our, our sins, our failures, our inability to be faithful to him. 
Dwight L. Moody, he was an evangelist and a revivalist in New England in the early 1800s. He said, let a man feed for a month on the promises of God, and he will not talk about how poor he is. <laughs> so live off the promises and your mentality will change. Yep. It will change, guaranteed. The Hebrew language has no word, no word that corresponds to promises. <laughs> Instead, the word that we read as promises in, our, in the Bible, in Hebrew, those words are word, speak, say, very ordinary, plain language words. You know what that means? That means God's promises. There's no distinction between what God speaks, what God says, and his promises to you. It's not like man, where we have to distinguish when I talk to somebody, where we have to distinguish, no, no, I promise I'm going to be there. I promise. There's no distinction in God. What he says, what he speaks, is a promise you can bank on. His words don't return empty. That's what the Hebrew language is testifying and saying. God's promises are so secure, it's just his speech that you can bank on. In the Greek New Testament, promise is a word associated with announcement. You will miss out on a lot of really good, important information if you tune out all the announcements. You know, I think about even uh, this past week when Pastor was talking about what's happening through the water filters that we gave to the maximum security prison and how it happened at the right time, the cholera outbreak. And can you imagine if Breakthrough Brett were not here for that announcement? the joy that would have been robbed him, you know? But instead we got to see, and we all got to join in on that joy of what's happening now in Kenya, right? Through that announcement. So the promises of God are meant to be announcements that we pay attention to and that release joy, that release the goodness of God in our lives as we hold on and grab and pay attention to those announcements. Some major promises in scripture, and I'm not gonna go through all of this, but there, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna go through 8,810 <laughs> promises in scripture, but these are just some major themes of promises throughout scripture. The promise of a seed, the promise that we would be God's people and that he would be our God. The promise of land, I yep. receive that I receive in Jesus' that. name. <laughs> yep. The promise that I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake yep. you. Yep. The promise of blessing on you and on all, yep. all your children, your children's children. Yes. Blessing on all the nations. The promise of an everlasting king in Jesus. Yep. The promise of the Holy Spirit, your comforter, your helper. The promise of rest, that's a promise he gives you. You choose to enter in, you choose to grab that or not, but that is a promise that he gives us. That rest is your portion, that living from rest is your portion. The promise of eternal inheritance, the promise of resurrection. This one always gets me a little weepy. The promise that there's going to be no more death no more sorrow, no more pain. Every tear is going to get wiped away. That's a promise. The promise of an unshakable and ever-increasing kingdom, which means it's a lie that this world is getting worse and that Christians are decreasing and that the kingdom of God is decreasing. No, of the increase of the government of Jesus, there will be no end, which means his government is ever increasing all the time. That is a promise and it's unshakable and it will never change no matter what's happening in this world. Second Peter 1 verse 1 to 4. If you want to turn there, if you want to look, um, we're going to spend a little bit of time here, but 
I'll read this. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. How and what? In the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So in the knowledge of God, in the knowledge of Jesus, grace and peace gets multiplied in your life. In the knowledge of the word of God, which is about Jesus, which centers around Jesus, grace and peace is multiplied to you in the knowledge of him. As his, so God's divine power, has given to us all things, highlight that, all caps that, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, this is like one big long run on sentence, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which, so by the glory and virtue of Jesus, we have been given exceedingly great and precious promises that through these, through the promises, you may be partakers of the divine nature. So through the precious and great, exceedingly great promises of Jesus, you become made to be a partaker in the divine nature of Jesus. So God gives us the promise that comes through the glory and virtue of Jesus, and in us receiving those promises and living obedient and grabbing a hold of those promises, we become partakers of the divine nature of Jesus. That's how we're transformed into the image of Jesus. We grab a hold of his word. We grab a hold of his promises. We let them sink in. And as we do, we're transformed into the image of Jesus. And through that, we escape the corruption that is in the world. I mean, this is great news, right? God is the one who gives. God does it through Jesus, through his glory, through his virtue. And we receive that and become like Jesus. What's our part then, right? Because that sounds like a pretty great deal. <laughs> Happens by God, through God, in God, and we receive it. What's our part? Our part is faith, perseverance, perseverance, and obedience. And there's verses up here. But all of these have to do with mindsets. Mindsets. Over and against circumstances, over and against what you're facing, the challenges over against what other people are saying, over against what doctors say. What does your faith look like? Faith is demonstrated in trust, in active trust, in doing, in action. So that's how we inherit the promises of God. Perseverance, uh, just one of the verses. And so after he, Abraham, had patiently endured he obtained the promise. So it requires endurance, it requires perseverance, because that's also how faith is demonstrated through the test of time. Do you still hold on? And obedience. Be faithful in what he stewards, and he will give more. He will give more. Be obedient in the little. This is how the promises are inherited, little by little, incrementally over time. Yep. That's how the promises of God are inherited. So this is about mindsets. And I want to ask everybody, where in your mind are you in need of an upgrade? Where in your mind are you in need of an upgrade? This past week, Monday, Tuesday, there's a conference happening this weekend for Abner, and we just had one a few weeks ago, so it's kind of been a, a busy season. Um, and this past Monday and Tuesday, it was just like literally every five minutes, a little fire here and there, just coming up left and right all over the place, which to me, 
means this weekend's gonna be amazingly powerful. <laughs> it's gonna be explosive. That's, that's what it means. Um, it, it also means that um, I got tested. <laughs> I got tested this past week. And um, so I'm, um, I'm helping prepare, I'm helping take out these fires. And you know, I have to say, God really called me out on my attitude. Um, he really called me out on my attitude, my heart posture. And I like this. There's no consolation from God of like, you are right, all these people, they're not reading your emails, you know. If they just scrolled down a little, they wouldn't have to ask you all these questions and call you every five minutes. There's no, there's no consolation from God around that. You know what I heard him say? I heard him say, Tina, you need to mature. You need to mature. You need to move past this. You need to grow past this. And I said, you are absolutely right, Lord. I'm so sorry. This is terrible. Like, the whole purpose of this is to serve the people and to give them an amazing weekend. And my attitude was so poor. And I said, you're, you're so right, Lord. I'm so sorry. Like, you got to help me because... I am feeling the flesh. <laughs> yeah, and this morning, um, I have to say, this morning I woke up early and this is what I mean by we gotta declare war. This morning I woke up, I started pacing in the living room because I, I said, this is gonna be a different day. There's no way Monday and Tuesday is repeating itself for a third day. I am taking authority over this day. I'm taking authority. Yes, I say God. peace over every situation of chaos. All chaos must stop. I felt like I was throwing atomic bombs. I said, you know, every place where in the enemy's camps, my name is written, DK's name is written, our family, this church, Abner Suarez is written, the ministry is written. I, dec I just cast all of that. I throw a fire of the Lord Jesus Christ in the enemy's camps where our names are written to destroy and annihilate every plan, every weapon that he's trying to form against us. I destroy it in the name of Jesus. Every place of chaos I speak order into right now. Every person that's registered for this conference is going to be blessed. It's going to have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be an upgraded in Jesus' name. I was declaring war. I really felt like I had like camouflage paint on. I'm like, I'm ready to battle. I got guns. I'm ready to go to war because I am not having Monday and Tuesday repeated. What happened this morning is I got an upgrade. I got an upgrade. But in order to get an upgrade, I got called out by the Lord. I got corrected. So what we need to do is we need to let God correct us. We need to let God answer this question. Because what he wants to do is he wants to upgrade you. There should be no shame. There should be no shame in correction. There should never be guilt. There should never be condemnation. You should never accept that. That's not from the Lord. Take all of that off and ask God, what's the upgrade? Where do I need to be upgraded? Where do I need an upgrade? And the truth is, we all need upgrades. I'm going to need an upgrade tomorrow. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm going to get it if I posture myself right. So this is limitless. God wants to give us the mind of Jesus so that what comes out of us when we're pressed is not me, because that's what came out of me Monday, Tuesday. God wants Jesus to come out of me. God wants Jesus to come out of you. And we need upgrades for that in order for that to happen. So I want us to spend just a minute, ask God, is it in an attitude towards another person? Is it how I'm thinking about a project, a work situation? Uh, is it a family member? Is it my financial situation? Is it something I'm waiting on? Is it a transition I'm in? Where, Lord, do I need an upgrade? 
And I'm going to give you a minute to allow the Holy Spirit to speak. And even you watching, don't forward this, you know, get past, past the minute. Spend time asking God, where do I need an upgrade? Don't rob yourself of what he wants to give you. So I'm just going to give you a minute and pause. And God's going to show you where he wants to give you an upgrade. Thank you, Lord. God, I thank you for your correction. I thank you that you want us to respond well so that we receive continually the upgrades. Yeah, and show us how, Lord. Show us how to walk this out in Jesus' name. Amen. This guy, George Mueller, you guys heard of him? You know who's heard of him? Bishop Zoe's heard of him. <laughs> she really knows him. Um, powerful, powerful lady. So George Mueller, um, this man, R.A. Torrey, writes about George Mueller and says this. One of the mightiest men of prayer of the last generation was George Mueller of Bristol, England, who in the last 60 years of his life obtained the English equivalent of $7.2 million dollars. And remember, this was written in 1924, so 7.2 million back then. And G George Mueller never prayed for a thing just because he wanted it. He also never asked for money. He always just received it by prayer. So George Mueller never prayed for a thing just because he wanted it or even just because he felt it was greatly needed for God's work. When it was laid upon George Mueller's heart to pray for anything, he would search the scriptures to find if there was some promise that covered the case. Sometimes he would search the scriptures for days before he presented his petition to God. And then when he found the promise, with his open Bible before him and his finger upon that promise, he would plead that promise. And so he received what he asked. He always prayed with an open Bible before him. That's an invitation. <laughs> That's an invitation. He would always say he doesn't even have the gift of faith the way you think about it in 1 Corinthians. He just lived a life of developing trust. Developing trust in God and that just continued to increase in this situation. He saw God come through. Okay, trust him more, trust him more. And he built a lifestyle of trust. And that's how he saw the promises of God. He built five orphan houses and cared for 10,000 orphans in his lifetime. And he says that the three chief reasons for establishing these orphan homes were in order of significance. First, that God would be glorified. He wanted, through the establishment of these houses, he wanted people to know that God could truly be trusted in every area, every need of your life. That was the first and primary reason. And second, it was about the spiritual state of the children. And then third, it was about their material state. But first and foremost, it was about the glory of God. And to be a witness, to say to people, truly, God can be trusted in every need, in every situation, in every circumstance you find yourself in. So this is a model for us, because he would say he's not special. He's just walked it out. He's just chosen to believe that the Bible is true and that we can have what it says. Unlike George Mueller, many times people's prayer lives are in reaction to circumstances. Nobody in this room, I'm sure, but people out there. 
pe people's prayer lives are in reaction to circumstances. So something comes up and then your prayer life is activated. That's most people. Dear God, help us. God intends for our prayer lives to be proactive, for you to create the environment you want to walk in, you want to live in, you want to create that environment at your workplace, at your home, at church, outside in the streets. That's God's intent, is that our prayer lives would be a proactive stance where we create the environment that we want to live in through our words. And this is not about manifesting, you know, and just saying what you want, incantations, that's uh, witchcraft, <laughs> that's witchcraft. So this is not about that, this is not trying to manufacture a world, an idyllic world we want to live in apart from God. This is about speaking words that are in line with the Word of God, and that's how things are created. It's living in dependence on the Word of God, Jesus, and in dependence, in relationship with Him, you speak words that create His kingdom and move His kingdom forward. And that's what God intends our prayer lives to look like. Not a reaction, proactive. Proactive. So this is an invitation for us, even that little exercise we did, do it every day. If God wants to give us upgrades all the time, we're the ones that are holding back from receiving that. So be proactive in your prayer life. Don't let a Monday and Tuesday lead to the Wednesday. Just start off the Wednesday every day and have that be your normal. I'm, I'm talking to myself too. So these are some examples of ways that we can use words and create and partner with the Word of God. Um, read this in your heart or out loud if you want, but I'll just read them out loud. These are very simple prayers you can pray every day, every morning. Just speak these out. Father, thank you that today is going to be a great day. Thank you for health over my family, my children. Thank you that you will supply every need according to your riches in Christ. I speak life over my body. I speak your wisdom, your revelation over every decision, every situation I'm going to face. I speak your wisdom and revelation over it. I speak order and peace into every place of chaos that will come before me. Thank you that you're my help and you're my shield, that you're mindful of me, that you bless those that fear you. Thank you that you cause my eyes to be open to see wondrous things in your word that I otherwise would not have been able to see apart from you. Thank you that your word causes me to have great peace where nothing can make me stumble. Thank you that when I'm reproached for the name of Jesus, I'm blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on me. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who continually pours out the love of God, the love of the Father, Father into my heart. These are really simple, but they're all based on the Word of God. And you just speak it over yourself, and it shifts your mindset. It shifts the yes. environment you, you walk in. Yes. Excellent. This is another situation for you to ask God to speak to you about. A place of reconciliation and blessing. Father, is there someone that you're wanting me to live in greater reconciliation with? Is there any place my heart's offended? All the blessings and the things that you want for yourself, is there anyone you don't share that same heart of blessing towards? Is there anyone God's bringing to mind when you ask these questions? If that's the case, what I would say is, and, and I have so many testimonies of this, I'm not going to share them, but... I have so many testimonies of this, where privately I am praying the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ between a relationship. And maybe it's a relationship where, in my heart, I'm cool, I have no ill will, I feel no you know, negativity towards this person, but maybe on that, that end there's something, you know? And so the, the body of Jesus, is not reconciled then, right? Even though, hey, I think I've done my part, but there's no reconciliation there, and that's the body of Jesus. I don't care for that person liking me, but 
I want them reconciled to Jesus. I want them reconciled to the body of Jesus. So this is what I pray. I pray the blood of Jesus to stand between us because that's what brought reconciliation between us and God. The blood of Jesus by the cross of Jesus Christ. So I'll just pray, God, I pray the blood of Jesus, the cross of Jesus to stand between me and blah, 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 blah. And I bless them in Jesus' name. Yep. That's as simple as it can be. And there have been so many times, guys, where someone has apologized to me later, somebody has given me a hug later, and I know it's not me. It's the blood of Jesus being effective over that person's life and over whatever was there that the enemy tried to put in between. So this is what you do when God brings up, hey, is there somebody... Is there somebody that, you know, your heart's offended at? Or is there someone where you don't quite have a fullness of blessing towards them? You pray this and see how things change in your own heart and in the relationship too. That's one example. Promises to pray over others. So whether there's family members, coworkers, those that you want to see come to know Jesus, the breakthrough prayers come from the word of God. So just stand on scripture, speak scripture over that person's life. Second Corinthians four, three to four. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So you can just pray. I pray for this person, an unveiling of their eyes and their minds, come against uh, this, the God of this age who's blinding them, and we speak light into their life, the light of Jesus Christ, to bless them with spiritual sight so they might see Jesus. These are the promises to pray over others. And you will see people come to know Jesus simply through prayers that are persistent. Another example, last Wednesday, um, I, during service, during worship, I imagined walking through the streets of Pakistan I imagine walking through the streets of El Oyo in Dominican Republic, and all I was doing was I just speak light, I speak the strength, the strengthening of the spiritual man um, in the people of God in Pakistan. I speak light into this area that the body of Christ would get united and that light would shine and it would overcome darkness because that's what light does. So these are just biblical scriptures you're praying. In El Oyo, um, I'm imagining the streets we walked. I'm imagining the people we talked to. And I'm saying, I speak light into, into you in Jesus' name. I speak light that you would know the truth of the light of Jesus. There's a woman that we met in El Oyo. And I'll share this so you can keep praying as the team prepares to go to the DR soon. But in El Oyo, this was my, one of my favorite. I love the girls' home. I did. I love the girls' home. I personally wished I could have spent more time walking the streets of El Oyo um, just to see the people there um, and to see the conditions and, and especially the people who thought that Jesus lived inside the church and that in order to meet Jesus, he had to come to the service that Monica and I were speaking at that night. And when I was talking to this one woman, Marie, I just sat down, she had a chair next to her. And, you know, our counterpart, Dominican, was translating, inviting her to come to the conference. And you could tell she's politely, I, I don't think I can make it, I have stuff going on. And I was saying to Marie, Marie, forget the conference. Forget the church event. Does Jesus live inside of your heart? Do you know him? Do you know Jesus? And she said that she did a long time ago, and both her parents are pastors, 
and she's just left, left the faith. And I just had a very simple conversation with her. I just said, you know, if Jesus was alive and walking the earth today, do you know where he would be right now? And she's like, I don't, I don't know. I said, he'd be walking the streets of El Oyo and he'd be talking to you and he'd be sitting here talking to you. Because she comes from a legacy of faith. So inside of her, Jesus is pursuing and, and pursuing her and wanting her to know the truth of who he is. Not that he lives in a building and will only receive her if she comes in there. So we can pray the light of Jesus, the truth of Jesus to penetrate every lie in Marie's life. We can pray for El Oyo that it will be transformed. And that a church will emerge and that people will emerge that will go out and represent Jesus, not represent an invitation to a church. So this is what we can do. We can bless, you know, and pray for safety. These are just some Psalms, 91, 107. There's so many though. We can just insert these other places around the world and see God's heart for people and the nations expand in us expand in us. So I'm not going to go into all of these, but any situation you find yourself in, there is a promise. There are many promises that cover that situation in the scriptures. Waiting on a promise, facing a delay or an obstacle, wrestling with anxiety. Don't deny that you're going through these things. Just look and grab a hold of the word of God and receive the upgrade he has for you. Receive the upgrade. Don't deny what you're going through. Be real and find the word of God that's available for you. Your challenge and my challenge is not the challenge. Your challenge and my challenge is what you see and what you believe about the challenge. That's right. That's the challenge that you need to overcome, that I need to overcome. That's right. Do you see insurmountable problems? Do you take situations at face value? Do you, are you led by what everybody else says? Are you, do you join in on complaint? You know, for me, complaint really bugs me. <laughs> I noticed it really irritates me. Me too. <laughs> so do you join in on that? Complaint, you know why it irritates me? You end up, when you're supposed to be pouring out your heart to God, going to the source of all life and wisdom and solutions, you, by complaining, end up praying to the enemy. <laughs> Like giving him a signal, like come get me because I'm speaking your language. That's why I hate complaint. It's hard for me to tolerate it when I hear it. So our challenge is, do you see an insurmountable problem or do you see the provision that's in God? How do you see the situations and the circumstances you're in? And in this, again, there's always room for an upgrade. Matthew 9, I'll close soon. Matthew 9, verse 27 to 29. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? This is the key question. They said to him, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. According to your faith. Jesus' question to us, very often, we might not perceive it, but very often he's asking us, do you believe I'm able to do that? Do you believe that I'm able to take care of you? 
Do you believe that I'm more powerful, that I have more understanding, that I have the strategy, that I have the wisdom, that I have everything you need in this situation? Do you believe I'm able to take care of you? This needs to be our response. This needs to be our response. Because according to your faith, Jesus says, let it be unto you. That's what we receive according to our faith. God is able, period. God is able inside of himself to do and to be everything that we need, everything that we could long for. God is able. Excellent. Excellent. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? That's Numbers 23, 19. Faith in God's promises, that's about saying, God, I have complete and total confidence in your integrity, that you are who you say you are, that you do what you say you will do, that in the word of God, I am who you say I am, that I can have what you say I can have, and that I can do everything you say that I can do. Amen. Yep. Yep. That is faith in God's promises. It's you saying, I believe in your integrity. I believe in your integrity, God, and I bank on it. So God, we ask for your help in this and we just say yes we agree we speak over ourselves that i am who you say i am that i can have what you say in your word that i can have that i can do everything you say i can do according to your word God, we speak that over ourselves and every lower thought, we pull it down and we rebuke it and we silence it in Jesus' name and every place of oppression, every place that's been holding us back, every place where we've put on burdens on ourselves to try to do things in our own strength, we repent, God, and we ask for an upgrade. We ask for an upgrade today and we ask for another one tomorrow. And another one the next day. And more throughout the day. (laughs) I'll take three. (laughs) God, we thank you for your generosity towards us. That it's Jesus. You made a way for us to have all of that. God, would our knowledge of you, our love of you increase. Our appreciation of you increase. Our trust of you increase. God, so that nothing that comes against us can take us out, can sweep our legs. Thank you, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.